The gospel is filled with a particular paradox, and this, uh, this parable seems to embody that perfectly. And the paradox of Jesus is, is this. It's that simultaneously, everything that Jesus says and does uh, in our lives and in the gospel seems to feel in our hearts to make perfect sense. It's something that we uh, understand intuitively. It goes right back to our childhood. Sometimes children seem to figure out this logic quicker than adults. And uh, there's just something utterly uh, effortless about the love that Jesus offered that makes perfect sense. And yet at the very same time that we have this intuitively obvious gospel, everything Jesus does is also shocking and destabilizing and upsetting, and it doesn't seem fair. And this all happens at once with almost everything Jesus does. Jesus is this loving presence that we know we would fall in love with were he to walk through these doors. And yet everything he probably would say and do would shock us and confuse us and be very strange. Perhaps the best image that we have for this first aspect of, of God's love, and maybe the intersection of these two, is anybody who, has, who is a parent of more than one child. Where I, 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 I have been told, although I don't remember, that when, uh, when my brother was born, after about a week, I said, this is nice, but we need to send him home now. <laughs> story time was on the line and there were a lot of problems <laughs> and uh, it, it, at, it was very easy for me to understand at an early age that my parents loved uh, my brother and then my sister just as much as they loved me and at no point would I say well that's really not fair that you love my siblings as much as me because I was first and I totally logged like an extra two and a half years so I should get a little bit extra and we all understand this intuitively when it comes to the currency of love, which is what God tends to pay us with. There's pretty much one amount that we all get when it comes to God's love. And whether we've walked into the, the church or prayed to God for the very first time in our entire lives, uh, or whether we've been praying every day for our entire life, whether or not we think it's fair, God loves us the same no matter what. And yet, there's something uh, that seems very unfair and strange, and it intuitively feels strange to us, right? Everybody in this room uh, can easily accept the fact that God loves us and that in the eyes of God, all people on earth are equally loved, right? I feel like we can all agree on that very easily in the confines of this room. Then we're all going to get in our cars in the pouring rain, and we're going to go out uh, make a right on Ogilvy, because we can't make a left because of the median, and somebody's going to do something terrible in traffic, and we're going to think that person is a total idiot, and maybe I hope something terrible will happen to them. And almost immediately, we, we start uh, finding uh, ways of saying, well, God loves everybody, but obviously God probably doesn't like that person because that person is terrible. Uh, and there's all these exceptions that start to crop up almost immediately after we stop praying and after we leave this place. The same thing can happen with creation. I love canoe trips. And there's something magical about being in the middle of a park, on, on a lake, in a canoe. You're surrounded by creation. It's so obvious that God can work through creation, that the beauty of the earth is unfathomable. And yet, I'll get back to the parking lot, get in my car, and I'll be like, geez, I wish gas was a little bit cheaper. You know, and yeah, there's this gas, and I'm sure it has some kind of impact on the environment, but eh, you know, you know, we got to make, you know, I got to live my life. I mean, I can't get, you know, too weird, can't get too out there. And there's so many of these compromises we make with all of the things that we love uh, to be creatures. And uh, some of the things that God might be calling us to do will be, in our eyes, unfair or a little too much, or He can't be serious, God can't want us to do that. And so it would be if Jesus came through these doors. 
and was in our midst. We could make some comment. I thought about this earlier. We were joking with the um, reflection group on, on Wednesday that, you know, we'd, have, we'd, have, we'd want to introduce Jesus to certain people over other people, and we want Jesus to understand our parish, you know, leadership system, or I don't know. I don't think we would actually do that. I think if Jesus came through these doors, it would be wonderful, and it would be beautiful. And I think it would be amazing, and I think we would fall in love with Jesus instantly. The interesting question would be, would Jesus, when he left here, get in his car? How would Jesus get home? Where would Jesus go home to? What kind of stuff would he have? It gets more confusing. If Jesus, what if Jesus had been given all of the gifts and all of the challenges of our life, of my life, of your life? What if Jesus had been given your opportunities, your education, your upbringing? If Jesus had lived your life up until this moment, what are the choices Jesus would make with your life? What would Jesus do with your stuff? I feel that on one hand, Jesus would make beautiful, remarkable, incredible decisions with your life. Jesus would love people that you love. Jesus would laugh at the things you think are hilarious. Jesus would, if you have the, the gift of, of, of art or cooking or uh, athletic talent, whatever it is, Jesus would rejoice and be glad at all the things that you rejoice in. But at the same time, Jesus would probably also take your life and do something radical. That you'd be like, I can't believe Jesus made that decision with my life. I can't believe he sold that. I love that thing. Why did he sell that? Why is he calling that person? I don't, I don't ever call that person. Jesus seems to be calling them all the time. Jesus seems to be making really strange choices with where he's going. Jesus seems to want to move. Why is he moving there? I don't know. I don't know what Jesus would do with your life. Only you do. But I feel like, you know, there's that expression that goes around. It doesn't come around as much anymore. What would Jesus do, right? And it always seems to be like a conclusion or an accusation. Like, you, point. What would Jesus do? I, I think the only real way we can, we can use that question is, what would Jesus do with my life? And think of it not as a question, but as a prayer. What would Jesus do with your life? What are the choices that Jesus would make with the gifts that you have been given? There's not going to be an obvious answer, but it will be, at the very same time, so intuitively right that it'll break your heart with how true Jesus is with the love that you have been given and have to give and with the gifts that you have been given. It will be so true to who you are, the very center of your being. And yet, Jesus is also going to make some radical decisions that will destabilize your life forever at the very same time. And people will say, wow, you're, you're, being, you're more you than you've ever been, but I can't believe you just did that. What would Jesus do with your life?